Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, I cannot wait to introduce our guest to you. But before we do, there are some people I want to thank that we always thank. We want to thank the Mighty Brass, the Mighty Quinn Brass and Winds. These are the folks that we use when we're looking for instruments for our school here at Willow. Mighty Quinn Brass and Winds, www.brassandwinds.com. Check them out. Welcome to True MU. I want to help you learn about music. And so I've brought to you the best guests I can possibly find to get at the truth about music. So let's get to it. As always, there's a story. Um, those of you who watch the show regularly know that I'm a Billy Joel fan. And my favorite Billy Joel track happens to be a track that Billy didn't write. And in fact, it's a track that Billy did not play on. Uh, this track is Leonard Cohen's, it's a Leonard Cohen song. And uh, the piano player on this is not Billy, which is very odd. It happens to be a fellow named Matt Rawlings. Well, I was dying to know who could have pushed Billy Joel off the piano bench. And I wanted to talk to Matt Rawlings and he was kind enough to come join us today. Let me tell you about him. Matt Rawlings is a sought after piano virtuoso whose discography spans thousands of recordings. These range from Eric Clapton, La Lovett, Billy Joel, Johnny Cash and Queen to Metallica, the Dixie Chicks, Steve Martin, Edie Brickell, Mavis Staples, Sheryl Crow and more. In the producer's chair, his work has met both with critical acclaim and commercial success, including two Grammy nominations and one Grammy win. Matt Rawlings, thank you for joining us. You are so welcome, Adam. Thank you for having me, and thank it's, you for the intro. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, before we get going, I've got to know, how are you the only person who ever played piano on a Billy Joel track? And well, is that verifiable? Am I the only person that's ever played <laughs> Piano other than Billy? If you, um, well, if you can find another one, let me know. Because I, I know he's had other like keyboard players, but that's interesting. Sure. So in your intro, you said uh, I was the only person to push Billy off the piano <laughs> or like piano stool. But actually, it was Billy who pushed himself off the piano stool. Okay. So this, how the story goes is, so this was for a Leonard Cohen tribute record that was being done in Nashville back in the 90s. Did you say the year? I don't. I can't remember the year. No, it's on his uh, Greatest Hits Volume 3, and that's how I know the tune. Well, originally it was on, uh, I, I'm trying to think if the record was called I'm With You. Mm -hmm. um, originally it was on a, a record um, that a guy named Steve Lindsay, who's an old friend of mine in Los Angeles, and he is a publisher and a producer and a songwriter and uh, just an uh, amazingly talented guy. And he put together a tribute record to Leonard Cohen. And uh, and so I played on a couple of tracks. I played, I think I played on a track for Aaron Neville maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but but there was a Billy Joel track. And so he and this guy, Tony Brown, who's a, a massive producer in Nashville and who I uh, knew very well and played on a lot of stuff for, they, they hired a band. And so, um, uh, and they didn't know what Billy wanted to do. So they hired, they sort of hired everybody. They they had a full rhythm section, both myself and Steve Nathan as keyboard players. He hired a full, Paul Lyme played drums. I don't remember who played bass, but a full big band because he hadn't gotten any sort of direction from Billy at all. They had, I, I don't know if they had tried, but they hadn't received anything. So anyway, it came it came time to cut this track. And, uh, and I think I wrote a chart and um, all the musicians are standing around and they had, I, uh, I think maybe Billy was a Steinway artist at the time because they brought a piano in and, uh, and you know, is it a big studio with a piano, but they had brought a specific piano in for Billy. And Tony asked him, you know, are you going to play piano on this record? And and my memory of it was that Billy said, well, uh, if the key is low enough, then I'll sit and play piano and sing. But if the key's too high, I got to stand up so we'll have somebody else play. And so it was that, it, it was literally that was the the deciding factor. Huh. I, I think I sat and played and went through some keys while he sang and he picked a key and he goes, nope, too high, got to stand up. And <laughs> so then suddenly I was in the piano chair and that's how it happened, you know, wow. it's literally as simple, as simple as that. That's fascinating. I actually, one of the reasons I like that track so much is because it seems to me Billy's freer not having to play to sing huh. and your piano playing is spectacular behind him and it's really Thank moving. Um, so it's just a wonderful collaboration. Uh, it's interesting because his classic albums, not only is he playing the piano on his own tracks, but he's playing and singing at the same time. And that's yeah. how he was recorded. So this is very special. So well, thank you it's for that. it's a it's I'm it's a credit I'm proud of for sure. I'll tell you one more thing, which is that after we recorded that, uh, Tony and I 
Tony invited me to go. This was the era that Elton uh, and Billy were both touring together and they would both play shows and then they would they would like they would do a thing where they sang each other's songs. Like it was right. a whole thing that they did for a while in the 90s. So Tony and I, Tony Brown, um, we went to see that show in Nashville and then afterwards wound up in the bar of the Vanderbilt Plaza Hotel in Nashville with a bunch of people sitting around. My old friend Ray Herndon was there and we kind of closed the place down and there's a piano there. And my, I think it was my friend Ray and Billy was there. Billy was at like sitting there, had, you know, we were all hanging out at this bar and, and, and we might've been the only ones there at that point. It was midnight or, or midnight plus. And somebody said to me, I think it was my friend Ray Herndon. He said, Matt, why don't you play something? And I just spontaneously, Billy was there. I said, I will, if he will. And so <laughs> we both got up and we sat at the piano stool together and played Ain't Misbehaving. And it started with, I think it started with me on the top playing the melody and Billy playing the bass line and chords on the bottom. And then we actually swapped <laughs> and he got up and I slid down and there's a, somewhere there's a photo of it. This was pre, you know, pre smartphone, pre anything, right. but it was one of those like magic sort of moments, you know, that there's no, no record of, <laughs> unfortunately, but well, that's really nice. Yeah. Well, okay. So we know now what you're like professionally and who you've worked with. What kind of a piano player are you and what kind of a piano player are you not? Wow. Um, okay. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm an instinctual piano player. I'm a I'm a rhythm piano player. Uh, I am a soft and uh, introspective piano player. I am not a super sight reading piano player. I'm not a classical piano player. Um, I can be a rock and roll piano player, and I have been, but it's not really how I would identify now. Um, a lot of things I did in the you know thirty plus years in Nashville are the records I played on. I you know I had to be a lot of different things that you know now that I've you know moved out of sort of everyday session playing in that mode anyway that I'm you know I'm not really don't really care to care to do <laughs> right. so i don't know if that answered your question that's no, you know there's a lot more but that's that's what came to mind well i'm sure we'll get to more of it uh let's uh talk about your history um you were born in connecticut D had you already started playing uh in connecticut before you all moved to chicago chicago's where it started so we you know we moved to chicago in the early 70s yes i was born in connecticut 1964 early 70s we moved to Chicago and then when I was nine, so it was, you know, 73-ish, something like that, um, I started taking piano lessons at a place in downtown Evanston, which is that we lived in Evanston. And in downtown Evanston, there was a guy named Alan Swain who had a, a teaching studio. And and you're an educator. I don't know if you've heard of Alan Swain, but he, he uh, you know, at the time he had, you know, he was, he had a series of instructional books for young pianists and he had a... I just kind of lucked out, I feel like, with my parents finding this place. He had a little stable of teachers, but there was a method, and the method was really through the lens of jazz and of swing, and and so that was my earliest stylistic um, sort of uh, um, landing point as a pianist. I had listened to other records as a kid, uh, you know, younger than that, but as far as playing, that was the first um, you know, doorway <laughs> that got, got open for me. Yeah. Alan Swain just passed in tw uh, 2022. I'm sorry for your loss. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I barely knew Alan, but the teacher that I had was a gentleman named Dan Rowinski. Ah. And, uh, and, and a couple of years ago, pre pandemic, I was touring with, with, uh, Alison Krauss and, uh, and we played it. I think it was Ravinia outside of Chicago and I just looked, I, 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 I don't remember exactly what the process was, but I, but he had died. I found his obituary and actually it's funny because uh, on that show at Ravinia, Allison introduced me and then asked me about it. And I wound up getting up on the mic and sort of telling this little story about like, yeah, this was the, this is where it all started with this guy and Alan Swain. And, you know, he just, he died. So Well, take a second to talk about your first teacher. What was he like? How, how did he teach you? 
Well, I, you know, I don't, it's, it's, it's a long time ago. Sure <laughs> it's, enough. it's literally just 50 years ago almost, <laughs> uh, which is sort of terrifying to think about. But um, like I said, there was a, there was a method. So uh, my memory of it was, you know, I was taught to read music and, uh, and I was taught to, um, uh, you know, proper hand position and, you know, like the, the, so they didn't, they didn't skip the rudiments. They, they, they covered those bases, but as soon as I was able, they had simplified versions that it was two things. They had simplified versions of, of popular songs of the day. So this was the seventies. So I, you know, early, early stuff I played were, were songs like uh, bad, bad Leroy Brown, mm -hmm. um, Jim Croce, and I feel the earth move Carol King. That was like the tapestry era. I mean, I remember the year tapestry came out, but it was right around then. So I played a couple, I played, I feel the earth move. There was another one that uh, I discovered some old music, one, a Carol King called jazz jazz man, I think. Okay. Um, which was a really cool song. It's less one of her lesser known ones. So there was that and they, and they had simplified uh, written, written versions of these songs. And then the other part was that they had a whole library of these songs, uh, like single page, uh, little jazz tunes and they were like I, to my memory they were called blues with a z and <laughs> like they had blues number one blues number two and it might have just been b-o-u-e-s yeah. but my memory thinks it's b-o-u-z-e but what these were were um written little they were like they were like little jazz etudes so it, it had a melody and it had a walking bass line and and uh and that's how they were played and so um you know, I've written a bit about this, but it, it's like the concept of swing. This is where the, the the concept of swing was introduced to me, and really, it was it it wasn't like a new. It was like something awakened. You know, like mm -hmm. something. Uh, that's really the way to put it. Something awakened, and uh, this concept of of swing, and it's it's been with me ever since. It informs everything. I mean, you know, you're a musician, swing. Swing doesn't just mean swing, swing feel like, you know, if, you know, swinging is sort of, is sort of synonymous with grooving with the pocket. And, and that's really was my first introduction to the concept of, of that, of a pocket of swing, of feeling and feel and music. And so that's what I associate with those, with those early years. It just, it, it, you know. Yeah. I'm so glad you, all of it, you know. I'm really glad you brought that up. It is a pet peeve of mine when people call swing basically just a, a triplet time and a you know in a two four four beat. It's uh, swing really is much more about something that propels you, and there's lots of ways to achieve that. And if you found that young, you were very fortunate because some people don't find that even when they're older. Yeah, yeah, it's um, and I, you know, as because I'm a you know I teach as well, and and uh, and as a teacher, I'm constantly encouraging pianists to uh to try to connect their body with what they're playing and to me that's the the, the whole notion of swinging because there's as many different ways to swing as there are different musicians i mean it's it's sort of infinite it's it's every musician has a different way of feeling it but the ones that are great the great the ones that that uh, you know the musicians that when i listen to them make me want to move those are the ones that are you know it's in the body and we joke there was it was a there was it was always a joke in in studios as a session player that uh you want to try to play from the neck down like that's the goal you know <laughs> and the brain is great but it's it as far as playing music the brain can't be in the driver's seat you know it doesn't know how to do it right. um, the brain is about the past and the future the body is right now in this moment and the body is where where you feel. That's where you feel things. You know, it's the 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 pocket. You know, yeah, low end, high end. It's all somewhere in your body. I mean, to me, any any musical frequency, I can identify sort of an area in my body that it's that it's uh, you know hitting. Well, looking at the other musicians was maybe the hardest thing for me to ever learn to do. And once I started to do it consistently, that's when it changed for me, and I really started to feel like I could find whatever pocket they needed. Mm. Mm, that's a great thing. Looking at other musicians, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, that I teach is uh, is this concept of you know because uh, it's easy to say you know listen you want to listen you want to listen to the band you want to listen to what's going on 
And that's sort of an informal practice. If you, if you go at it from, you know, a mindfulness perspective, that's sort of an informal practice. And I've developed like a, a bit more of a formal version of that practice, which I use. And it's, and it's, it's sort of based on percentages. So if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm accompanying a singer, I'm going to put uh, 80% of my attention, like consciously. So not just, I'm not just listening to the singer. I'm consciously, I'm, and you know, you can't of course really dial in 80%, but just telling yourself that this is a percentage. Like for me, just, just naming it as such changes it. And, and so if I put 80% out on the singer, the rest of that 20%, uh, uh, you know, can do everything, can, respond to what's happening, can read the chart, can play a fill. Like it's amazing how, how, uh, how we can multitask in that way. And it's also the concept of, you know, you work so hard for this craft. So, you know, let the craft work for you. Um, but what, I, and what you just said, the reason I said all that is because I find myself, um, uh, that when I find myself looking at the other players or looking at the singer, that, uh, that it really helps this. It really, it it really aids in getting out of my own way and employing this sort of, you know, 80, 20 or 75, 25 model and, you know, just get the spotlight off of myself. And then it's a conversation. Then it's actually a real time conversation that's happening, which is always what, you know, what I'm going for. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Your family moved you all to Arizona and you were confident enough as a high schooler to start playing around, were you not? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, we moved to Phoenix in seven, uh, or Paradise Valley, but Phoenix area in '79, and um, yep, I started. Uh, I started gigging, and you know that th the summer after my junior year of high school is when I got hired to join this band at this place called Mr. Lucky's in Phoenix, which sort of changed the course of of my life. Um, but uh, I had I had met. When I was a freshman in high school, my my high school had this great program every spring for two weeks. They would call it New Horizons, and there were a bunch of different things you could do for New Horizons. You could go on a trip to with you know with with a faculty member to go hike Zion Canyon or blah blah blah. There were a bunch of these things, but but then a, a, another thing you could do is you could do what was called the Shadow Program. You could opt into that. The Shadow Program you would have to you would have to ahead of time identify and approach and get permission by a professional in an in a in a field you were interested in to to shadow them for two weeks and then whatever that meant you show up every day you do whatever you know it's like a sort of apprenticeship and so there was this great jazz program at a, at a place called um uh, mesa community college and mesa is just a town east of east of phoenix but in the same sort of valley and uh, mesa community college had this it was a two-year community college with this amazing jazz program, and there were two guys two, on the faculty, a guy named Grant Wolf and another guy named Don Bothwell, who were, it's just, it was just like a unicorn sort of situation. These two guys were amazing world-class jazz educators, and they built this program, and they had ama an amazing band. So that's what I did. I went and shadowed their jazz program for two weeks. I met a gentleman named Matt McKenzie who was playing bass in one of the ensembles, and we stayed friends. And then, you know, a couple of years later, I just get a phone call and said, hey, you know, I, I play in this band five nights a week at this club and it pays this amount of money. And our piano player is moving back to Texas. Do you want to come audition? And it was, you know, it was a gig five nights a week at a club for like real money. And what he didn't tell me on that phone call was that Mr. Lucky's was the biggest honky tonk in Phoenix and that this was like a real rockin' modern country band. And, yeah. you know, I was like a jazz dude. So I, I was not, you know, <laughs> country. I mean, I had I had a, you know, albeit misplaced, you know, but healthy disdain for country music at that point. <laughs> so, so it, it, you know, I walked in, I went, I said, yeah, I'll audition. So the night came and I auditioned, I, I drove down there and I showed up, you know, I was a little private school punk you know with my button down and my top siders and i walk into this place <laughs> and this giant of a man steps out right at the front door he was like he was right in this little room like the size of a buick and just you know may i help you here's this little kid i mean i don't know i mean i i don't look my age now i probably look 12 years old back then <laughs> you know i said yeah i'm here to you know i'm here to audition and he made a call you know they had a band room with a phone that they could you know and so they ushered me back. I wasn't allowed to be in the club, right. um, but I could be in the band room. And I auditioned. I play, and then they asked me back the next night. I played two nights. They hired me. 
And that was, you know, I played there for two years, um, which could lead right into the, uh, uh, the the Lyle Levitt story, if you like. Yes, but before we do that, um, I'm going to yeah. have to, I'm a dad, and I'm like, well, wait a minute now. Five nights a week, <laughs> you're in a junior in high school. How late are, are you out exactly? And are you yeah, getting your so, homework done? Yeah, well, so that's, so I had done three years at a private school, right? And, um, you know, my my parents knew at that point that this was what I was going to do, that I was, you know, I had, I had, I had made it very, very plain. And it was also plain by just the way that I played and the opportunities I was getting that this was going to be my path. And so, you know, we had a, we had a pretty serious come to Jesus about it. And, uh, and the private school would have required me no matter what I needed to graduate, because it was just my senior year that I had left. So no matter what I needed to graduate, I would have had to be on campus at 830 every morning for morning meeting. They had, you know, this was the private school morning meeting thing. And uh, so we looked into public school and found out all I needed was uh, a government and econ, a semester each. And I needed a sem I needed two semesters of shop, right? That was <laughs> all I needed to graduate at a public school. So we made that decision and, and I was able to show up at school at like 1130 every day and take my two classes. And then I would, you know, get get in the car and two or three days a week, drive west for rehearsal. And uh, and yeah, so Monday through Thursday, I was done at 1, p 1 a.m. Yeah. And then Fridays and Saturdays after hours was 3, 2.45. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, they didn't yeah. know half what I was doing. But, <laughs> I mean, here's the thing is they, they met these guys I was playing with, and this was a band called J. David Sloan and the Rogues. And J. David, who's now going to be 81 and who I just saw a couple weeks ago in Phoenix, I did a benefit for my mom's theater company. He came out and sang, and he is still, he's just one of the greatest humans I've ever met. And, you know, he, they trusted him. They trusted him with their kid. And um, and apparently they trusted me. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's how it went, you know. That's amazing. Um, well, and then you went to Nashville after that. Is that correct? Well, so there's there's more to that. So um, about half, you know, about a year, something like a year or so in to my tenure at Mr. Lucky's, this this gentleman walked into the club one night and and he came back to the band room on a break and he met, you know, I was the youngster, but there were Jay David and then a guy named Billy Williams, who they were the two sort of, you know, they co co ran the band, and uh, and this guy was from Luxembourg, <laughs> and he was in the states trying to book American talent for for this big festival in Luxembourg they have every summer called the Schuberfauer. Now, the Schuberfauer is this I don't know if it's continuous, but this is a thing that's been going on in Luxembourg since like, you know. I don't know, like this the 1700s or something, a version of the Schuberfauer. It's like a, this storied thing, this big carnival. And they still do it, right? And they do it. And so they do it in old, the old city of Luxembourg and um the old cat, the old main, you know, like there's a there's a there's a modern sort of city now, but the old and the old version is where they hold this. And um and he said he he wanted to hire us to come and play for a month in like the American music tent, right? Yeah. And he made an offer and and they, you know, I didn't have a say in it, they accepted. And uh, and so however many months later, we all flew to Luxembourg and uh, and started this wacky gig. And so the gig was, it was this big tent and they, you know, they had a big stage and there were three acts. Uh, there was there was our band, you know, six piece electrified, like, you know, great, really amazing but, you know, fully, you know, amplified and everything. And I, you know, I played a bunch of different keyboards and two guitar players, bass, drums, vocals, fiddle, all this stuff. And then there was a band they had hired from Florida called Body and Soul. And they were kind of a family, like it was a mom and dad and their kids and then some other people too, but they were like a big show band with horns and dancers and like this whole other thing. And then <laughs> this, this other guy had been hired and he had been hired by a different person, right? He had been hired by this guy um, who was doing graphic design for the festival. And he his job was to play the set changes. And it was just him and his acoustic guitar. 
and it was Lyle Lovett. And it was Lyle had, you know, was just a fairly recent Texas A&M graduate and, and was a, like a folk singer. He had, he had never, he hadn't, you know, made any records. He was a local Texas Houston area. He played at the clubs, Anderson fair and all these, all these uh, clubs around Houston. And, uh, and so we, the, the first week, you know, we would play and then Lyle would get up and play and then body and soul would play. And Lyle started noticing that, that in between, you know, when he would get up to play on the set breaks, nobody would pay attention to him. Everybody would just start, you know, buying beer and making noise. And, and, uh, and so he came to us, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe the end of the first week, he showed up at our hotel and, you know, kind of hat in hand and, and very kindly. And, and we had all become fans of him just listening for the first week. We, we were all like, Whoa, this guy's, you know, this guy's amazing. And, and he asked us if we would be willing to back him up for, you know, four or five songs. And, and so he would have a band and, you know, have a better chance of sort of, you know, and there's a backstory or there's another story, which is that the guy who hired him uh, got fired sort of immediately after he got there and it only bought him a one-way ticket. So really <laughs> his, his big fear was that he wasn't going to have a way to get home. He was worried like, God, I'm kind of, kind of bombing out here and I only, I don't have a ticket home. <laughs> so that was part of his motivation for asking us was yeah. like, you know, I need to sort of, you know, I need to prove my worth and, you know, or whatever. So anyway, we wound up doing that. And, and, you know, among the songs that, um, among the songs that that we learned way back then, there was uh, like Cowboy Man, Give Back My Heart, uh, God Will, Waltzing Fool, like, some, you know, uh, all of the songs that that wound up on either his first or second record, they all and amazing songs that were already written by that point. So, um, so to, you know, to make a long story even longer uh, mm -hmm. about you know, so that summer, that was the summer after my second year of working there, I quit the band because I had decided to then return to my original path of going to college, playing jazz, move to New York, you know, that whole, you know, that whole thing. And mm -hmm. so I had been accepted, you know, with a scholarship to Berkeley College of Music. And I was, um, and I was just spending the summer working. And I actually worked after I quit the Lucky's band. I worked with Francine Reed, who was a local mm -hmm. jazz singer. She had a, her, her whole family were very big in the Nashville scene. And I joined her band along. Uh, I'm not sure if Matt McKenzie was in that band at the same time. He may have been. But um, so, so then Lyle got in touch again with Jay David and Billy. And 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 uh, and he wanted to hire all of us because he had raised a bunch of money. He wanted to he wanted to record he had, when, when we all played with him in Luxembourg, he had never played with like a real rhythm section before. And it was really sort of, uh, I think it really opened his eyes to like, wow, like my music can be maybe more than just me and acoustic guitar. And he worked with this guy, James Gilmer, playing congas and a cello player named John Hagen. And those two guys stayed with him the entire time that I worked with him over all these years. But um, so he came to Phoenix uh, and to cut to ostensibly cut demos he wanted to cut 18 demos professionally and and try to go get a publishing deal and so mm -hmm. one of the last things i did before going to college was spend whatever it was a couple weeks in the studio billy williams producing the the band playing and then and then francine reed he said uh, lyle was was uh was looking for a you know a singer for some of these things so I said, and Matt McKenzie said, well, let's go check out Francine Reed. She's, you know, she's playing at this jazz club in Tempe. And he went and fell in love with her. And that began that whole history of Francine, who's, you know, been a part of his music for decades ever since then. Yeah. Um, so then, I, yeah. So then I went to Boston and started Berkeley. And about a year plus into Berkeley, Lyle called me on the phone and said, hey, Matt, <laughs> um, you know, I got my publishing deal, but I got a record deal too in Nashville. And uh, they're going to put out 10 of those demos that you played on as my first record. And I want to fly you to Nashville to do a little more work on them. All right. And that's also where I met Tony Brown, uh, who I talked about. And um, yeah, and that was the corner turn. That that was the uh, that was me saying, OK, I guess I'm not going to go to New York and be Bill Evans. I guess I'm going to go to Nashville and become a session musician. Yeah, I have a strange question for you because I knew you went to Berkeley College of Music yeah, and a yeah. lot of famous people went to Berkeley College of Music, but a lot of them didn't graduate because they were yeah. great and they went on. Why did you graduate? 
I didn't. No, I didn't graduate. Oh, you didn't graduate. Okay. Oh, no, no, no right. I'm one. Of, I'm I'm in that category. You're no, in that category, I, yeah. I spent probably five semesters, and then at the end, before I moved, you know, so I went. I went and played for Lyle for a couple of days, and it was amazing. And I came back, you know, and I'm back in school. And then, you know, two things happened. Um, one is I got a check about a month later. And it was, you know, more than I expected. It was a master scale session. And uh, and it got me thinking, huh, so like people do this for a living. And like, this is the amount of money I made for basically three hours of work. Like, <laughs> this, like I might be onto something here. And then the other thing that happened was Tony Brown, the producer, he, and Tony is a piano player. And so Tony, before he became a, a very successful record producer, he played with, he was started as a gospel pianist, but he was, he played with Elvis. He might've been Elvis's last pianist. And uh, he played with Amy Lou Harris and her hot band. He played with Roseanne and Rodney, Roseanne Cash and Rodney Crowell. And um, so he was the guy who, who was producing these Lyle records in Nashville that I went and worked for. And so he heard me play and you know he kind of thought huh like this might be somebody we might want to encourage to move to nashville so he called me a number of months after the lyle experience and said hey uh we have this development program at mca he worked for mca and uh, so we sign artists to development deals that we aren't quite sure if they're gonna if they're gonna get full record deals yet but i've got two artists i wonder if you want to come to nashville and play on their development recordings so he flew me out and that was really the, that was, that's kind of closed the deal, you know, yeah, right. that, uh, that I could actually go there and, and be a session player. But uh, before, you know, before I went, you know, I, 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 I stopped going to Berkeley and I, I had subbed for a teacher of mine. There was a, there was a production in Boston of Little Shop of Horrors um, that was a, you know, a really great production. And I sub he played, there was a, the conductor played piano and then there was a keyboard chair, bass and drums. And the keyboard played Rhodes and one of those Korg CX3 organs and a Juno 60 and everything, all the all the presets, the volumes, everything was in the score. And so it was a really, you know, it was it was a, a difficult, a challenging gig. So I subbed for him for a while and then he he handed the gig to me. He quit. I got the gig. I I did that for most of a year uh, to make money to move to Nashville. I bought a 1973 GMC pickup truck with a camper shell and uh and moved to Nashville in it in you know the end of 1986 yeah yeah well, I would love to talk about every single artist you worked with that would be great I wish we had time for that but we <laughs> yeah. don't um, that'll have to we'll have to do that on a series of interviews but Absolutely. there's one person I want to ask you about who yeah. fascinates me and his, it's Mark Knopfler and mm. I know you collaborated with him a lot and I wanted to, yeah. to you to tell me he seems to be a hard person to get to know through the internet I uh, want to you could talk yeah, he's a. I, I think Mark's a really. Uh, he's a really private person. You know, he's not. He's not a. Uh, um, yeah, I mean that's as, as simple as that. I so I met Mark in. I, I don't know if it was ninety six. He so Mark when when Dire Straits ended, then the next project he did was the Notting Hillbillies, mm -hmm. um, and then after that he made his first, you know, quote unquote, solo record, Mark Knopfler record called Golden Heart. And he came to Nashville and did a series of sessions with a, a handful of different bands. And I got to do, I was on one of them and got to do t maybe two days of recording. I think I'm, I'm on three or four songs on that record or two, th maybe three songs. And, um, and so after recording that record, he put a band together to tour, to do his first big tour. And it was, it was a, you know, so I got the call to yeah. do that first tour. And, and at first I said, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and then, you know, it was right around the time I was starting to get busy. I was really busy playing, but I was starting to, to, to really make some traction as a producer. And I had produced Keith Urban's first solo record. And, and I, I ended up going back and saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to pass on this. It was, it was two years. It was like a two year commitment. And, uh, it just, I, 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 and when really thinking about it, I decided I didn't want to be gone. I had spent so much time building a career in Nashville. And at that time, you know, it was a bit out of sight, out of mind in Nashville. Um, yeah. Or at least that was my impression. I'm not sure if that was actually true, but that was my impression. So, so I didn't, I didn't go on tour. And then uh, Jim, a guy named Jim Cox, brilliant musician from Los Angeles. He got the gig and stayed with Mark until, well, 
through like 2002, 2003, all those tours. And then he developed an inner ear issue um, that prevented him from flying. Um, and so in 2005, Mark did a tour and, and, and he started planning it the year before, but it, this tour was, um, was going to go not just Europe and the States, but also Australia, New Zealand, Dubai, like places that you couldn't, because, you know, Jim would have taken a boat to London and, uh, and that had been, uh, you know, something he actually had done uh, a couple of years before for a tour, but this one, that wasn't possible. So I got the call and, um, and then I, I joined the band and I did, I did, we did a solo Mark Knopfler tour in 05. And that was the one do all these different places, massive tour. And then 06, uh, we toured the record that he and Emmy did together, all the road running, he, him and Emmy Lou. And then we did another one, another world tour for Mark in 08 and another one in 2010. And I think during that period of time, I played on two more records. I, yeah, I played on, I played on one called Get Lucky and one called, I think, Kill to Get Kill to Get Crimson. That sounds right. Those two solo records. So, so yeah, I spent a, a lot of time with him and, uh, and he's a, he's, you know, he's a brilliant and dear guy and just, just being able to play, you know, Romeo and Juliet on stage with him or just, just, you know, it's to me it was and he's you know he's an amazing artist amazing guitar player but the songs are are to me the most riveting part of that experience is to mm -hmm. hear this guy sing these songs that you know this body of work that he's created um yeah so it yeah. matters to you what song you're playing on then oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know i mean my my early discography might <laughs> might belie that <laughs> but, but but you know but i mean you uh, got to make a living but it, it's, it's yeah it's, i don't yeah. think every and, pianist cares what they're playing on and you yeah do. i i uh and you know i've i think i've just sort of as a natural consequence of of doing this for 40 plus years it's changed for me i think when i was young and in my 20s and hungry yeah it was like say yes to everything and build a career and that was all that was all great and i had a ball doing it and and uh uh, you know, I played on a song called, uh, uh what was it called? <laughs> okay. God, it was terrible. Something like good dog, bad biscuit, bad, bad biscuit. Uh, I don't say it was just, it was just, you know, like that wasn't the title, but something like that. It was so horrible. Oh, come on, know? Matt. There's only thousands of them. Can't you remember? Yeah, there are thousands. There's, you know, I blocked them out. <laughs> but um, but but you know, it it didn't matter. It was the camaraderie, and it was yeah. it was being a session player, and like having this, you know, having this uh, mastery and this ability to go in and and you know collaborate with this group of guys that I was just playing with every day and that I loved and. And, you know, it was, it was like, you know, we were all a bunch of badasses. It was just, it was great doing it. And so now, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't have a desire to do all of that. And, and to me, I'm just, I'm, you know, it's like, I'm, it's not appropriate, you know, that, that, that to me, that kind of work is for younger guys, uh, you know, and, you yeah. know, not, that, you know, I mean, work is work and, uh, I but I don't you're enjoy, not I don't enjoy, anything. it's, it's more, it is more important to me now that, that the content um, is meaningful to me and no judgment about any content, but I think more and more for me to actually participate in a way that I feel is authentic, I need to connect. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, that's changed. I mean, that's a natural consequence of just getting older too. I mean, you, I think it is. You got less time like, and you don't want to waste it. Yeah, I don't. I got more behind me than I got in front of me more than likely. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, who are some of your favorite piano players? Um, well, like historically, you know, it started with Ramsey Lewis and Oscar Peterson mm -hmm. as a huge Oscar fan for many years. And then it went to, to you know, Bill Evans, um, but also Herbie and Wynton Kelly, like as far as the jazz guys. But I was really deeply influenced by Billy and also by Elton John. Like I was a huge Elton John fan and had all those records. And so, you know, I, as as I when you asked when you first asked what kind of a piano pianist am I? And I said rhythmic. Like that's rhythm is a is a is the is the absolute core of of what I do, um, and yeah. and you know I learned a lot of that from listening to Elton John records and and Billy Joel records, but um, you know and Dr. John and um, you know all these guys that are 
you know, that sort of play like drummers, you know, and I think drummers really love playing with me because, because that's, you know, because I, I help, you know, like, right. like I can lock in with a drummer and, 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 uh, you know, I have a thing that I tell students, which is like, there's no middle ground. You're, if you're not helping, you're hurting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I believe that. I think that if, you know, there's, there's no like neutral, just, you know, if you're just hanging out and kind of not committing or whatever, then you're hurting like that hurt. Like to, then, you know, you're just taking up space. Yeah. And know? if drummers think, if they think you're listening to them, they're like a dog, they'll come and be your friend. For oh yeah. They love you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Drummers are like dogs anyway. I yeah. think just... I'm not really saying drummers are like dogs, but <laughs> no, I'll say it. They're real friends. <laughs> We've interviewed a lot of drummers, and we don't want to get that impression on our show. No, my son is a drummer. <laughs> uh, they're brilliant, actually, but they do so. love to be listened to. I've noticed because people don't well, tend to listen to them. So, yeah, and and it also helps helps them like to have somebody on stage who is connecting with what they're doing. It's just like it gets, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a uh, my whole thing is like how do we get this thing to lift off the ground, mm -hmm. you know, and that happens when everybody is actually having that conversation and it becomes bigger and you lose yourself in it. And it suddenly doesn't become about what I'm playing, what you're playing. I'm not, you know, and it's what you said. It's everybody looking at each other and everybody putting their attention out on each other. And then suddenly the thing, you know, the many becomes one and it just lifts. It just, it just rises off the ground. And those are the, you know, those are the transcendent moments. All musicians live for those moments, you know.